Well, I do count it a privilege uh, to be able to be here and uh, to be able to speak to you. It's great to be at a place where you know we all agree on God's word and biblical authority. I've had my share of being in places where you can see the professors sharpening their teeth while I speak. <laughs> so it's, it's great to be at a place where I know we're, we're loved and have a great kinship and appreciate Dr. Anderson and what, um, what has been done here at Appalachian Bible College. One of the few uh, Christian institutions in America that takes a stand on biblical authority from the very first verse as, as we need to. Well, the ministry of Answers in Genesis is an apologetics ministry, and that doesn't mean we apologize for our faith. Uh, that means we help equip people to be able to defend the Christian faith and uh, to be able to be more effective in witnessing for the Lord Jesus Christ and have a consistent biblical worldview. And so Answers in Genesis has many facets to the ministry, and then we have the Ark Encounter. I know that many of you have been to the Ark Encounter. That's our uh, traction that we have. It's um, actually from here. It's what uh, three hour, about three hours, three and a half hours uh, from here. So easy drive. And then uh, to the museum would be another 40 minutes from there. And that's the drive we're going to do tomorrow night after we finish because we're driving home. Got to uh, get back tomorrow night. Just thought I'd give you a little update on the Ark Encounter. And so this is our 2500 seat answer center that we have and we have a new rainbow arch entrance and our playground that we have for kids it's one of the top six playgrounds in america our truth traveler virtual reality experience it's just, it's really fun to sit in those seats and you feel like you're actually having a ride it's like a virtual reality ride back to the time of noah and then our zoo at the back which we're expanding building a big new petting zoo for children and for everyone really uh, this year and then the ark itself of course biggest timber frame structure in the world one half times the length of the football field half the width of the football field 3.3 million board feet of timber and at the highest point is 10 stories high and then you go through all three decks each deck has a different sort of theme to it answering a lot of the most asked questions people have teaching people how to think correctly about the world and presenting the gospel we do that both the Creation Museum and the Ark. That door there with the cross on it is one of the most photographed parts of inside the Ark. And uh, you can spend a lot of time there really looking at all the different exhibits. And then the Creation Museum, which is 45 minutes from uh, the Ark Encounter. And the Creation Museum, we're continuing to expand that. We're building a conservatorium. Uh, this year and four big greenhouses to go with it including greenhouse will be, will be raising the plants of the Bible and then we'll have a classroom there as well for teaching biblical worldview in regard to botanical things because we have zip lines at both places um, that's in the Bible too somewhere I'm sure <laughs> and we have a playground there at the Creation Museum actually the two playgrounds we have uh, for children of all abilities so they're specially built uh, for that and you know the adults can go on the playground equipment with their kids or grandkids too and our planetarium we've just upgraded that to a laser projection system so it's the most cutting-edge technology in the world for a planetarium and then our 4d theater we put on those infrared glasses they have little batteries in them you have better 3d than you'd ever see at the movies and then all of our new exhibits that we have there and biblical authority and uh, the foundations from Genesis and then the walk through the Bible and we continue to upgrade and add Christ cross consummation the whole life of Christ the whole message of the gospel and a lot of detail there our fearfully and wonderfully made exhibit most powerful pro-life exhibit in the world that we're upgrading this year uh, three times the size our insectarium a dinosaur exhibit we just added an exhibit on Israel as well uh, called Borderland and so you might want to come and work for us uh, because we have lots of positions open and then our summer positions for seasonals so I encourage you to think about Answers in Genesis and the Ark Encounter Creation Museum go to answersandgenesis.org slash jobs actually have about 90 full-time positions open right now so we have about 900 full-time staff and we add 600 seasonals uh, during the year at various times. Well tonight I want to talk on this subject, Divided Nation, Cultures and Chaos in a Conflicted Church. 
The illustrations I use tonight are in the book and at the front of the book there's also a link where you can go in there and download these illustrations in PDF, JPEG, PowerPoint or Keynote and they're free and you can use them to teach this message uh, that I'm sort of going to give you the basics of tonight and I put notes on each of the illustrations so that it'll help you know what to say about that because I believe this is a cutting edge message for our church and encourage you to be able to take this message out uh, across America and around the world. We have a major problem in the church in the West. We have a major problem in the church in America. There's an exodus from the church. I mean, this exodus is occurring in the whole West. If you think about England, I've been to England many, many times, been across the United Kingdom. In England, church attendance overall is down to about 4%. And think about that in relation to what it used to be in the past. Same in Australia and Canada. And in the United States, I mentioned this morning that if you go back generations, probably about 70% at once attended church in America. But this is research done by the Pew Research Center in 2010. They divided groups into generations depending on when they were born. So the greatest generation, that's the D-Day generation, born before 928, 56% went to church. Then you look at the silent generation, it's 44%. Then the boomers, I'm in the boomers generation, 32%. Then Generation X, 27%. Then you get to the millennials, 18%. You can't deny that we're seeing a generational loss from the church. And no matter what has happened uh, there and what churches are doing, we're seeing that generational loss continue. And then you get to Generation Z. As Christian researcher George Varner recently said, they're the ones born between 1999 and 2015, the first truly post-Christian generation, twice as likely to be atheist as any previous generation. And a recent Gallup poll in seeking out those who would identify as LGBT found that if you look at what they called the traditionalists, those over the age of 74, it was 1.3%. Then the baby boom is 2%, Generation X 3.8%, Millennials 9.1%. But look at Generation Z, it is 16%. And we realise something catastrophic is happening to the world view of these younger generations. And it's obviously not biological, there's something going on with their whole uh, world view. And then a little bit of more modern research on church attendance, and this is GSS Data Explorer. And if you combine Millennials, Generation Z together, you see that church attendance is down to about 11.3%. So we're seeing that continual decline and the loss of those generations from the church. And I want to say that uh, to help us understand what I believe is happening here from a big picture perspective, I've taken the Pew Research because they, they have these nice graphs. And I've drawn a red line right here. And here's what I want us to think about. If you look at the older generations, you know, the baby boomers back, the older generations, they're, they're the more, what I would call, Christianized. What do I mean by that? I mean, many of your founding fathers were Christian, or at least they respected the Bible, and the Judeo-Christian ethic that came out of the Bible permeated the culture. And so America has been, in fact, the whole Western world has been permeated uh, by a predominantly Judeo-Christian ethic that came uh, from the Bible. But if you look at the younger generation, so if we go now to uh, generation... Uh, Z and the millennials and so on, when you go down to the younger generations, they are much more secularized. Now, as you think about that, I've drawn that uh, line there. I believe this is all coinciding with the loss of the younger generations from the church. But it also coincides with the change that's occurred in the education system. Because for the older generations, um, you know, the majority of people have gone through the public schools. In fact, even today, 85 to 90 percent of kids from church homes go to the public education system. Now, that system used to be fairly Christianized as well, in a sense. In other words, there's a veneer of Christianity. Christian morality permeated the education system. And so, you know, what was considered right and wrong and so on was basically uh, a, a, a Christian in accord with a Christian worldview. Also, you know, the Bible was allowed in schools and teachers could even teach creation. I mean, when I was a teacher back in 1975, I was allowed to teach about creation in the science classroom and so on. I taught the kids about evolution too from their textbooks and what was wrong. But I, I was able to teach uh, creation nonetheless. So I had that freedom. 
But when you look at the younger generations, we see something that's different. See, in, in the, when you look at um, previously as well in the public schools, there was a time when you could sing Christmas carols and uh, you could have prayer on assembly or prayer uh, before a football game or graduation. But look at the education system today. They're basically throwing God out, the Bible out, prayer out, creation out. And you see that, that evolution is taught as fact, naturalism is taught as fact, that you explain everything by natural processes. And so we see this change that's occurred there. And that change corresponds with, if you think about it, as uh, the, the generations were progressively more secularized and the, the Christian morality was, was thrown out and the Bible more and more taught against, we're seeing a change in our culture in accord with that, with the secularization of the culture. So we're seeing the change in the worldview. And also keep in mind, 85 to 90 percent of kids from church homes have gone through the education system so the younger generations have come through that system and they've come to our churches and one of the things we found from our own research they've asked questions in Sunday school of their youth pastors and others well what about evolution what about millions of years by and large they were told in the majority of instances that's okay believe what you taught at school in fact I found the majority of our pastors even in many of our conservative churches have highly endorsed the public education system and said oh yeah it's and it's important for you to be there, to be witnesses in the system. But, and and one, of the, one of the justifications for that is, you know, where to be salt, where to go out there and be salt. But, you know, just as a little aside here, you know what the Bible tells us? You can't be salt until you have it. And if the salt's contaminated, it's good for nothing. You can't throw them out to be salt if they haven't got the salt. That's a whole other lecture. We'll do that another time. But so what's happened is you have these generations that have been very secularized, the Bible has been taught against, they've been taught naturalism as fact, and they've come to our churches, and our churches have told them, oh, that's okay, you can believe all that, don't worry about it, just trust in Jesus, Johnny. But then they see that they're starting to walk away from the church because they're starting to realize if that's true, then how can I trust the Bible? If this part of the Bible is not true, how can I trust the rest? And so what does the church do? Well, it's interesting. One of the things that I've seen, you know, I, I get an interesting bird's eye view of the church that most people don't get because I have spoken in all 50 states, lots of different denominations, hundreds and hundreds of churches, Christian organizations, colleges, and so on. And uh, I've spoken all around the world for the past 40 years, so I tend to get a bird's eye view of the church. And you know what I've seen with the, with the church by and large? Here's what I've seen. Now, I always say a little caveat to start with. I love music, right? And I love to praise God through music. And as Dr. Anderson said, you love to sing uh, in here as well. And we, had uh, I'm singing this morning. So I'm not against music, but it's more to do with, with actually the motivation and the emphasis. Here's what I have seen. By and large, for a lot of churches, the focus has become not on the preaching of God's word, but on a praise team out the front that becomes performance-oriented more than anything else, because a lot of times you, most people don't sing the songs because they're not really those sorts of songs that you can sing as a congregation. So it's performance oriented with looking more like a concert and flashing lights and all the rest of it. And they've watered down the teaching of the word uh, so that uh, it's, it's, it's very, very shallow. They're not teaching apologetics or anything like that. And they think that making the church look a bit more like the world and increasing entertainment is going to keep those people there. And I'll stand back and say one thing, it hasn't worked because we're still losing generations from the church. So it hasn't worked. And we, we can see what's happened here that as generations have been indoctrinated in an education system that has also thrown out uh, Christianity and they come to our churches, the church hasn't dealt with where they're at, hasn't understood what's going on because most of our Christian leaders compromise with evolution in millions of years or didn't teach Genesis or they don't understand how important it is. Even many conservative pastors have said to me, oh, it's too controversial because there are people in the congregation that believe in evolution and creates too much, too, too much in the way of, of conflict and so on. So they ignore that. But here's what I want us to understand tonight as we go through this. Once you abandon Genesis 1 to 11, you don't have a foundation for anything to be able to deal with anything. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. By the way, I haven't started my talk yet. This is still the introduction. And so as a result of what's been happening, we're seeing the whole Western world 
becoming more secularised and less Christian from a, a worldview perspective. And in fact, when you look at what's happening uh, in, in America, you know, a lot of people think that you know, something different is going on. I want to also say to you tonight that what is going on has always been there. It's just that the veneer of Christianity that once was in the culture has been ripped away and now we're really seeing the spiritual battle for what it is raging right before our very eyes. We're, we're in a time when you can see the battle that's always been there, but you see it in, in, in a much more obvious sort of way. You know, one of the ways I think you could describe our culture today in the West is Judges 21, 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what is right in his own eyes. You know, there are people that say to me, what has happened to America? It's very simple. You take generations and teach them there is no absolute authority. The Bible is not the word of God. It's not the absolute authority. Man determines truth. And ultimately, anything goes. Therefore, morality is subjective. And it's whatever you want to uh, believe. And, you know, as I said this morning, when you have a culture where anything goes, when there's no king to tell them what to do, everyone does what is right in their own eyes, what doesn't go is the absolutes of Christianity, and they consider those who teach that to have hate speech and you're intolerant. You know, I, I, I see that uh, all the time. You know, I've had, um, for instance, I've talked to people from the LGBT uh, movement, and they say to me, you Christians are full of hate speech. You, you're intolerant of, of, of others. All we want is a tolerance of, of our beliefs. All we want is, is to have freedom for our views. And I say, well, no, you don't. No, you don't. And they say, yes, we do. We allow all views. I say, no, you don't. You don't allow all views. They say, you're the ones that don't allow all views. I said, no, wait a minute. You allow all views. What about the view that there's only one view and that's based on the Bible and there's only two genders and marriage is a man and a woman? And they say, well, now you're being intolerant of our view. But wait a minute. Aren't you being intolerant of our worldview? And they say, but, what, but you're not allowing all views. I say, well, you're not allowing all view. You're not allowing mine. But your view is saying we're wrong. Yeah, it is. And you're saying we're wrong. <laughs> you see the conflict? And by the way, that conflict, as I mentioned in the question time in particular, that's what we have to understand. It's a conflict of worldviews because you have a conflict in regard to the foundation we have for our worldview. And you know, when you look at all this, here's another issue that I see in the church. Many people in the church have a wrong understanding of all these issues, which is why they don't know how to deal with them. They look at them all as separate problems. But this may sound radical to some of you. They're all the same problem. They're, they're different symptoms, but they're the same problem. You see, the problem is they have the same foundation. Man's word determines truth. And if they are all the same problem, just different symptoms, that means they must all have the same solution. And the answer is yes, the solution has always been the same. What is the solution? God's word and the saving gospel. That's the point. And that's really what we want to, to deal with here this evening, to help us understand this problem and the solution and the conflict of worldviews because of a conflict of two foundations. You know, right now we're seeing a tornado of moral relativism ripping through the culture and it's capturing generations of our kids. And, and you know, people, people say, well, you know, for my grandkids, my kids, how can I make sure that, that they're not tossed to and fro and carried about with every uh, wind of doctrine and so on? You know, my, my wife often uh, discusses this with me in regard to our kids. We have five kids, four of them are married and 18 grandchildren. And we often talk about the fact they're growing up in a different culture to us. They're going to have to be able to stand in a totally different culture. And we need to make sure that we help our kids as they, as they train their kids, our, our grandkids, to be able to stand in this increasingly secularised culture. I'll tell you one of the blessings. Our, our kids have grown up with an ark and a creation museum. And they think that's normal. Uh, they've just grown up with it. And they think everybody has an ark and a creation museum. You know, everyone has access to it. And uh, they love the ark and the creation museum. And they've all been taught apologetics right from when they were born, basically. So we look at all this and say, OK, what can we do? What can we do? Well, the first thing is we have to understand, well, what happened? What happened? Well, what happened began 6,000 years ago in a garden. 
when God said to the first man, Adam, as a test of obedience, you can eat of all the trees. There's one tree you're not to eat of because if you do, you'll surely, what? Die. In other words, think about it. Obey God's word. But along came the devil and formed a serpent and came to Eve and said, did God actually say? Stop right there for a moment. What was the first attack? The first attack was on the authority of the word of God. The attack was to get Adam and Eve to doubt God's word so that doubt would lead to unbelief. This is really important to understand. The attack is on God's word. And then you will be like God. You decide right and wrong for yourself. You build your own worldview. You decide truth. In other words, no, obey your word, man's word, not God's word. And the point I want to make is this. A battle began 6,000 years ago between two foundations, between two religions. See, that's a whole other aspect of this that we don't have time to deal with tonight. But in reality, ultimately, there's only two religions. There aren't hundreds of religions. It all boils down to two, God's word, man's word. And from those two religions or those two foundations, you get two totally different worldviews. And I will add, just to the side here, that when you take man's word and add it to God's word, your foundation then is no longer God's word as a Christian. Once you've added fallible man's word into God's word, your starting point is really man's word. We, that's what we have to understand. And so what was the first attack? Well, when you look at 2 Corinthians 11.3, I want you to notice something in regard to that first attack. The Apostle Paul has a warning for us. And to paraphrase it, I want to warn you, the devil's going to use the same method on you as he did on Eve, which means on you, on your kids, on your grandkids. The devil's going to say, use the same method on you as he did on Eve to get you to a position of not believing the things of God. By the way, Paul obviously believed in a literal Eve uh, because he's pointing back to that uh, particular event. So what was the method that the devil used on Eve? Did God actually say? In other words, God is warning us. God's word is warning us. The devil's going to use the same method on you. He's going to use the same method on your kids. The same method he used on Eve, that method was to get them to doubt the word of God. It's an attack on the word of God so that doubt would lead to unbelief. You know what we should be saying today? We should be saying to ourselves, if God's warning us that, that the devil's going to use the same method on us as he did on Eve, we need to be aware of that method and understand how that method is being used today so that we can equip them and we can make sure that they're uh, not taken captive by this. That's what we should be saying. And so I call that the Genesis 3 attack. And so I have a question for us. What is the Genesis 3 attack of this era? You see... The attack has never changed. The Bible makes that clear. The attack is always going to be the same. It's going to be an attack on the authority of the word of God. But you know what? The devil is very clever. And so that attack will manifest itself in different ways in different times. How does it manifest itself today? See, think about it this way. When Peter and Paul were preaching about the resurrection, do you think anyone ever came up to them and said, okay, but what about dinosaurs? Did they go on the ark? Well, no, they didn't get that question. You know why they didn't get that question? The word dinosaur wasn't invented until 1841. It's sort of an arbitrary term, really, uh, that it covers a whole range of land animals. No, they didn't get that question. Do you think when Martin Luther uh, in the 16th century was nailing those theses on the door of the church, as he's purported to have done, do you think anyone come up to him and asked, yeah, but what about carbon dating? Well, no, that's a 20th century invention. The point I want to make to you is, Peter and Paul and Luther and others down through the ages have had to deal with all sorts of attacks on the word of God. But we live in a particular time when I believe a particular attack started in the 1800s through to the present and that we need to be cognizant of what that attack is and how it manifests itself. You know what's interesting? I've traveled around the world for the past 40 years, many different countries, and it doesn't matter what country I'm in, even third world countries that I've been in, when people know you're on about the Bible, they know you're on about the gospel, they know you're on about Christianity, you know what I found? They ask the same basic questions. You know how those questions go? 
well, don't we live in a scientific age? Well, hasn't science disproved the Bible? Well, how do you know the Bible is true? What evidence is there for God? Who made God? You believe in Adam and Eve? Where did Cain get his wife? How'd the races come about if there are only two people to start with? Where's the evidence of the flood? Don't fossil layers prove millions of years and evolution? We know man evolved from ape-like creatures. How could the story of Adam and Eve be true? How can you believe in a loving God with all the death and suffering in the world? Didn't dinosaurs live millions of years ago and evolve into birds? How could Noah fit all the animals on the ark? Hasn't science proved evolution is true? Isn't the Bible an outdated book of mythology? Just for interest, put your hands up if you've heard those sorts of questions today. Oh, wow, that's a shock. That's all the hands in the room across here. No, it's not a shock because you know why? I find that wherever I go, with any audience across America, around the world. And I suggest to you that these are just some of the Genesis 3 attack questions of our day. Now, here's the sad thing. They're the sorts of questions a lot of the younger generations have been asking their, their youth pastors and their Sunday school teachers and their mums and dads and their pastors. And you know, in the majority of instances, what they've been told, don't worry about that. Don't ask those sorts of questions. Believe whatever the, the world has taught you, what the school, don't, don't, I'm not a scientist, that doesn't, just trust in Jesus, Johnny. But you see, the message of Jesus comes from this book. And if the history in this book is not true, how could the rest be true? And not only that, if Genesis 1 to 11, as I'm saying tonight, is the foundation for everything, and much of the church gave that up, for the younger generations, how are you going to deal with the issue of gay marriage? How do you deal with abortion? How do you deal with the gender issue? How do you deal with the racism issue? You can't deal with any of those issues unless you have the foundational history to build the right worldview to know how we should be thinking as Christians. And much of the church gave that up. And it really began in the 1800s when, as I was saying in the question and answer time, when the religion of naturalism, which means man explaining things without God by natural processes, started to be popularized and was adopted by much of the church. You see, because back in the 1800s, what started to happen was this. There were scientists who's, who were atheists, deists, who rejected God's word, who wanted to explain everything by natural processes, who said, the fossils didn't come from the flood. We don't believe in a global flood. The Bible's not true. The fossil layers were laid down over millions of years before man. You know what started to happen as a result of that? Well, Thomas Chalmers, for instance, the founder of the Free Church of Scotland, said, oh, we can take the millions of years and put them in a gap between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2 and invented the gap theory that got into the Schofield Bible and the notes in Schofield Bible and became very prevalent through much of the church because many of our older generation church leaders actually adopted the gap theory thinking, oh, that's a way to fit the millions of years in. Who's heard of the gap theory, by the way? See, we've all heard of the gap theory. And then others said, oh, we can put in the days of creation and reinterpret the days and then the day-age theory. Who's heard of the day-age theory? See, we've heard of these. They perme the gap theory, the day-age theory, they, they permeate the church. They permeate Christian colleges and, and Bible colleges. And so these views started to arise uh, in the church with many of our church leaders adopting them. Then along comes Darwin, who popularizes ideas of evolution. And what happened? There were Christian leaders who said, oh, God... Uh, used evolution, so theistic evolution. Uh, we see that starting to permeate uh, churches and colleges. Some people change from gap theory to theistic evolution and so on. And uh, then a, a local flood instead of global flood, etc. And then along comes the idea of the Big Bang. And then many leaders said, oh, we'll say that God used the Big Bang. And so if you look at Bible colleges, seminaries, churches today, church leaders, Christian academics and so on, you'll find that they are permeated with these sorts of views. Gap theory, day-age, theistic evolution, day-gap day, framework hypothesis, progressive creation, Adam is a metaphor for Israel, cosmic inauguration, temple inauguration view, humans from animals with amnesia. I mean, there's all sorts of creative ways that, that Christians have come up with to try to fit the millions of years into the Bible. And by the way, every one of those positions, do you realise this? Every one of the compromised positions on Genesis has the same one thing in common. Trying to put millions of years into the Bible. See, millions of years is that big issue. That's, that's really where this all came from. The, it came out of atheism, uh, trying to promote naturalism, and the whole millions of years then drove all of this that we see happening, uh, permeating 
of the church today. I mean, I've, I've been to churches and colleges where they say, oh, we have an elder who's a theistic evolutionist. Oh, our denomination adopts a, the framework hypothesis. Oh, our pastor's gap theorist and so on. And, and they say to me, so what's your position? And I say, oh, the biblical one. Because I just start from the Bible and I let it speak to me. You know, I was interviewed on, on radio once by a Presbyterian minister, actually. And if you can understand this point, you, you're going to get what I'm really saying. By the way, this is still the introduction. But if you can, if you can understand this point, this is where, where I'm, I'm really uh, getting to. So he said to me, he said, now you agree that in the church there are you know, different denominations and there's some different theological views. And I said, yeah, and they can't all be right. And so that's obvious. And you said, for instance, eschatology, you know, pre-mill, post-mill, R-mill, treadmill, windmill. I mean, there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of different views of eschatology out there. And I said, that's true. Baptism, sprinkling, immersion, speaking in tongues, that it's a, it's a past gift and others that say it's not, and Sabbath day and so on. I said, yeah, there's lots of different views in the church and those issues. Obviously, they can't all be right, but different views. And he said, and we have different views in Genesis. It's the same thing, but it's not. It's very different. And if you get this point, you'll start to understand really why Answers in Genesis emphasizes what it does and what we're really on about. Because I, I mentioned this morning that I've always positioned this ministry. It, you know, we, people say to us, oh, you, you're young earth creationists. Young earth is not the issue, right? Evolution is not the issue. They're consequences, but it really comes down to biblical authority. And I mean, this ministry, I've always positioned as a biblical authority ministry. That's what we're on about, the authority of the Word of God. And so I said to this pastor who's interviewing me, I said, but here's the point. I said, you, when you're talking to somebody about different views of eschatology, different views of baptism, whatever, I said, primarily, you're arguing from Scripture. And you're saying, well, this verse says here. Yeah, but in context over here, it says this. Ah, but what about this passage here? Yes, but okay, but what about this? You know, interpreting Scripture with Scripture and so on. But when it comes to Genesis, the reason we have different views, because the scientists out here are saying this. In other words, you're starting outside of Scripture with a worldview promoted by these secularists going to Scripture and changing it. And if you understand that, you start to understand why this is so important, because it's an issue of authority. You know, that many people say to us, who cares whether it's old earth, young earth? Who cares? I tell you what matters, and this is what we're going to do in chapel tomorrow as we talk about the six days of creation. Does it matter if we take God at his word or not? Because that is the issue. You know, when you think of a house, you have the foundation, you have the walls, you have the roof. If you wanted to destroy the structure, what's one of the best ways to do it? You start eroding the foundation. And as the foundation is eroded, eventually the structure collapses. And what I'm saying to us is this. In the era we live in that began in the 1800s, an attack began on the foundation of God's word, but particularly on the foundational book of Genesis. And over time, as that attack has increased and much of the church helped the attack on that foundation, now we're seeing what's happening in the church with the exodus from the church and the church not having the impact on the culture that it should and, and a very lukewarm church. And um, we're saying, what has gone on? And I want to give you a real practical example. And this practical example, um, I'm going to use a particular person. I'm going to use Dr. William Lane Craig uh, because he's said to be a leading apologist in America. He's a professor at Houston Baptist University and uh, at uh, Talbot, associated, Talbot School of Theo Theology associated with Biola. And uh, he also has his own organization called Reasonable Faith. And he has impacted many of our seminaries and colleges. In fact, he's held up in, in high esteem as a great apologist of the age. Let me just say to you, because I'm here in hopefully friendly territory, uh, here, I know I am, uh, but I believe he's incredibly destructive uh, on the church and on generations of young people. So a number of years ago, a number of years ago, Dr. William Craig made this statement. How old is the world? Best estimates today are around 13.7 billion years or so. 
Now, this is good, you see. I, I, this is a position I can embrace because there are people who, who will sit here and say, no, it's six and a half thousand years old. Um, you, that, that is not a tenable position? I don't think it's plausible. Uh, mm. the, the arguments that I give are right in line with mainstream science. Uh, I'm not bucking up against mainstream science. Now, that statement alone tells you something. When I debated Bill Nye in 2014 at the Creation Museum, when we got up to debate, because Bill Nye's big emphasis was science conflicts with the Bible, and the first thing I did was I said, we need to define our terms. What do we mean by science? You can't just talk about science without defining the terms. We need to make sure we do that. In fact, a lot of times we use terms and we don't realise we're just using them in the way the world is. Wait a minute, we need to define what this really means. And the word science itself means knowledge. And I said, there's a difference between knowledge or your beliefs about the past when you weren't there or knowledge gained by using your five senses in the present to develop technology. It's very different. So we called one historical science, beliefs about the past, and the other observational science. And here's what has happened. The secularists like Bill Nye and also William Lane Craig, because this has infiltrated the church and our colleges, use the one word science for both beliefs about the past and for technology. And they're not looking at the difference there. And so when he says, I go with what the scientists say, he's talking about millions of years. But millions of years is not observable. And that's an interpretation based on certain things. But in actual fact, there's a lot of evidence that con conflicts with that. But regardless, that's their beliefs about the past. And so he's accepting the secular worldview and adding it to the Bible, and he's using the word science. Now, one of the things that I've always said is once you start to do that, once you unlock that door that you can take man's ideas from outside the Bible and add it to the scripture, then you'll push that door open further and further and further and further. And we're seeing that with William Lane Craig because he came out with a book just recently on his uh, views on Genesis. And he was interviewed by another professor from Houston Baptist University, who also believes in millions of years and so on. And uh, I want you to hear William Lane Craig's answers. I would be disingenuous, Sean, hmm. if I were to say, I don't want the young earth creationist interpretation to come out true. Okay. Uh, to me, that is a nightmare. Uh, my, my greatest hmm. fear is that the young earth creationist might be right in his mm. hermeneutical claim mm. that Genesis does teach those things that I described earlier. And I say that would be a nightmare because if that's what the Bible teaches, it puts the Bible into massive, I think, irredeemable conflict with modern science, history, wow. and linguistics. If you take Genesis as literal history, it puts you into conflict with what the secular world is saying. We can't do that. Do you, do you see what's happening here? About the matter of Adam being made um, from dirt and Eve being formed from one of Adam's ribs. Are those yeah. elements uh, part of the myth in the mytho history or do you think they're historical? I think that is part of the figurative language of myth. I have long been uh, suspicious of things such as the creation of Eve from a rib out of Adam's side as though God performed some sort of literal surgery on the man and built a woman out of it, or that God shaped this figurine out of dirt and then breathed into its nose the breath of life and the statue came alive. It seemed for, to me that this was clearly figurative language. Hmm. It's clearly figurative language. Actually, he calls it mytho-history. What does mytho-history mean? It's history, but it's myth. Now, it's myth that teaches history. How do you determine the history from the myth? Right? Now, some people say, well, Jesus taught in parables. Yeah, but he said this is a parable in most instances, or this is like, right? Well, you know it was a parable. And by the way, a parable can't have meaning until the words actually have literal meaning to be used in the parable in, in, in a way of teaching a point, right? So when Jesus said, I am the door, we know what a door is, so we know what that means. It's got to have a literal meaning first or it doesn't make uh, any sense.
And so this idea of mytho-history is that, oh yeah, it teaches truth, but it's, but it's myth. Well, how can myth teach truth if it's myth? I think it should prompt us not to be over-literalistic in the way we read these narratives. And once you begin to look at them in terms of mytho-history, it's difficult to look at them in any other way. Hmm. I mean, when you read a story about two people in an arboretum with these magical trees whose fruit, if you eat it, will grant you immortality or knowledge of good and evil. And then there's this talking snake who comes along and tempts them into sin. And then you have this anthropomorphic God walking in the cool of the garden, calling out audibly to Adam in his, in his hideout. You think, well, of course this is figurative uh, and metaphorical language. This isn't meant to be read in this sort of literalistic fashion. And so once you begin to see these narratives this way, I think you, you begin to ask yourself, how could I have read them any other way? It would be like reading Aesop's fables literalistically. So he's just demolished Genesis, right? Genesis 1 to 11 is gone. So what do you do with the fact that Jesus referred to those writings? Or Paul, or Peter, others through the Old Testament, even Job who talked about Adam. Okay. Now, <laughs> uh, assuming then, for the sake of argument, the truth of evolutionary biology uh, okay. concerning human origins, we can imagine sometime prior to 750,000 years ago, a group of hominins, uh, maybe a, a few thousand, and through a biological and spiritual renovation, perhaps divinely induced, a, a miracle that caused a genetic regulatory mutation in a pair of these hominins, they were lifted to fully human status and capable uh, of supporting a rational soul through their brain and nervous system. Uh, and they would then begin to have children, and I think given their full humanity, they would naturally tend to isolate themselves from their non-human contemporaries. In time, eventually, they and their descendants would supersede all of the non-human descendant. Okay, I don't want to go on. <laughs> People, this is so sad. I mean, to me, it's borderline heretical. He's mocking God's word. And, and this is the state of Christianity and many of our colleges and, and seminaries. And by the way, I've got others. I'll give you some, some more tomorrow from, for instance, Wheaton College or uh, from uh, uh, St. Louis, from some reform colleges. And so, I mean, it is absolutely shocking what's happened. But this is the problem with the church. And it really is what happened in the 1800s with the church starting to adopt the secular worldview of naturalism and then starting to add that to the Bible and to change what the Bible says. And then what's happened now, they're throwing out Genesis 1 to 11 and we wonder why we're losing the coming generations and why we're losing the culture from a Christian perspective. It's, that's really an illustration of this battle between those two foundations. See, ultimately there are only two religions or two foundations for our worldview. So what can we do? I want to suggest to us, and I actually go through in the book five different things that we need to do, but these are two major ones, and that is we need to be raising up generations to be thinking foundationally. We ourselves may need to make sure we think foundationally and that we're raising up generations in our churches to be thinking foundationally, and that is the Bible is the foundation for all of our thinking. If the Bible is what it claims to be, which it is, the revealed word of God, this is a revelation from the one who knows everything, and we know nothing compared to what God knows, who's given us the foundation for building our thinking in every area. And then the second thing is, we need to be teaching apologetics 
1 Peter 3.15, in your hearts honour Christ the Lord is holy, always be prepared to make a defence or answer the word defence or answer is translated from the Greek word apologia from which we get our word apologetics, equipping generations to have a worldview starting from the Bible and with answers to the secular attacks of our day so they're not going to succumb to the Genesis 3 attack but a lot of what we do in our churches and Sunday schools and what we've done for years is what I said this morning, teach Bible stories. And don't get me wrong, we want to teach what the Bible says. But again, they're not just stories, they're real accounts. So we need to raise up generations thinking foundationally with apologetics. You know, that's what we do at the Ark Encounter, that's what we do at the Creation Museum. And at the Creation Museum, a centerpiece is the walk through the Bible, the Genesis to Revelation a walk through what we call the seven seas of history. Creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion. That's Genesis 1 to 11. And that's the foundational history for the gospel, for all of our doctrines, for the rest of the Bible. It's actually the foundational history for everything, as I'll, I'll start to show you some illustrations here. And so Genesis 1 to 11, when you look at that, and I've got that in a different color down the bottom there, because I want people to uh, understand that Genesis 1 to 11 here that's the foundation for the rest. And if we understand that Genesis 1 to 11 is the foundation for our worldview, it's the foundation for our doctrines, it's the foundation for the rest of the Bible, you look at most churches' statement of faiths. As far as Genesis is concerned, it'll be very general. God created. They don't say much else. And yet, if the specifics of Genesis 1 to 11 are not true, you have no foundation to deal with gender, marriage, the gospel, anything, ultimately. And so that's what I wanted to really show you tonight. I finally finished the introduction. And now to get into um, the nitty-gritty of this. Oh, look, I've only got an hour and a half left. Uh, so I want to deal with gender. Here's what I want to teach us tonight. Whenever anyone asks you, well, how do you deal with gender? Here's the answer. You've got to start with Genesis 1 to 11. How do you deal with marriage? You've got to start with Genesis 1 to 11. How do you deal with racism? You've got to start with Genesis 1 to 11. How do you deal with death and suffering? You've got to start with Genesis 1 to 11. How do you deal with the abortion issue? You've got to start with... That's what we're going to do. We're going to start with Genesis 1 to 11 and deal with gender. Genesis 1 27. God made man in his own image, male and female, he created them. Right there I get a strong hint there's only two genders. Because there's no other options. It's just male and female. In fact, if you look at Genesis 5 2, male and female, he created them. There it is again. I'm getting a stronger hint now, obviously. All through the Old Testament, you'll read phrases like this about humans, male or female. And then in the New Testament, Jesus, as the God man, when he's asked about marriage, says, Haven't you read? He who created them from the beginning made them male and female. That's Genesis 1 27. He's attesting to the truth of the writings of Moses here in Genesis 1, 27. He does it again in Mark 10, 6. From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Here's the point I want to make to us. If we are teaching our children correctly, our churches correctly, here's what we would say. Regardless of what the world says, regardless of all the claims out there, if we start from God's word alone, there can only be two genders. Now, a little bit of apologetics always helps, right, to be able to defend the Christian faith. And we need to understand what the world is saying. And so apologetics can be used to help confirm this. Well, in genetics, we know that humans are made up of 23, chromosome, 23 pairs of chromosomes. And um, the male have a pair of sex chromosomes. And the females have a pair of sex chromosomes. In the male, it's an X and a Y. And in the female, it's X and X. Oh, look at that. Science confirms two genders. Now, we also need to make sure we're aware of what the world is going to say. Oh, but wait a minute, there are exceptions. Some people can have three X's. Some people can have two X's and a Y. Oh, yeah, the, the, those things are very minute uh, percentage, very small percentage. But yes, uh, that can happen. That, that, that is true. But you know what? It's only when you start from Genesis 1 to 11 that we have a worldview to understand that. For instance, 
Sin entered the world, and death is a result of sin. It's no longer a perfect world. Romans 8 says the whole creation groans. Everything now runs down, and from one generation to the next, God doesn't hold everything together perfectly, so there are mistakes, copying mistakes and mutations, not just in the sex chromosomes, but in other chromosomes as well, and it causes all sorts of problems, but none of that negates the created order of two genders. And you see, that's how we need to be teaching our congregations. That's how we need to be teaching our children, our grandchildren, our Sunday school classes to help them understand that. And we cannot ignore the fact we live in a fallen world now, so it's not a perfect world anymore. And so that helps us understand why there are these other issues. How do you deal with marriage? Come on, have a guess. You start with Genesis 1 to 11. The Bible says God made man from dust, not from an ape man. I've had pastors tell me, you know, the dust represents an ape that God breathed into to become a man. Well, the Bible says from dust we came and to dust we return when we die. What ape are you going to return to when you die? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. And then God said, it's not good that man should be alone. And so only man was made in the image of God. And so God brought the animals to Adam to name to show that there was none like him. He didn't look at a female chimp and say, you know, she's close enough, I could date her or something like that. <laughs> he recognised that there was none like him. No one else was made in the image of God. So what did God do? Put him to sleep and from his side he made the first woman. From his rib he made the first woman. Then he brought her to the man and Adam got all romantic. And he said... This is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She'll be called woman because she was taken out of man. And you know, with, um, isn't Valentine's Day next month? If, if the cancel culture don't get to it. Uh, va Valentine's Day. So here's what you do. You take your girlfriend or your wife out for a nice dinner, take them to a nice restaurant, you sit them down, you look across the table, rip the mask off, make sure it's the right woman, do you realise two years ago nobody would understand that at all? <laughs> See, you live in an interesting generation. You understood that. And then you look at them and you say, I want to be like Adam when he was perfect. You are bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. You are woman. <laughs> well, you never know. And then the next verse, therefore, this is the reason. A man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and they'll be one flesh. Stop right there for a moment. Do you know what that verse is right there? The creation of marriage. Do you know who created marriage? God created marriage. Marriage was not created by the Supreme Court justices or Joe Biden. Right? Marriage is a God-ordained institution. It comes from the Bible. You know what that means? There's no such thing as gay marriage. And there's not. Now, they can call it gay marriage. They, can call, they call it all sorts of things. But... For a Christian, it's not gay marriage. They can call it gay union or whatever. When I write about that, I always put gay marriage and put marriage in quotes because it's not marriage. There's only one marriage, and that's the marriage God created. It's a man and a woman. He created Adam and Eve. In Matthew 19, we already looked at the first part of this. When Jesus was asked about marriage, he said, Haven't you read? He who created them from the beginning made them male and female. That's Genesis 1, 27. And then look at the next bit. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto, uh, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. That's Genesis 2, 24. That's Jesus attesting to the truth of Genesis 1, 27 and Genesis 2, 24. By the way, for those because you, you're here at a Bible college and I'm sure you study all sorts of in-depth things in regard to theology and so on, just a little aside here. How many of you have heard... Um, there's many theologians that have said Genesis 1 and 2 are two different accounts of creation. You've heard that? Well, here's an interesting passage to uh, use in regard to that. Here's Jesus talking about the same one man and one woman using a verse from Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. So they're obviously referring to the same one man and same one woman. So they can't be two different accounts of creation, which they're not. Genesis 1 is an overview, chronological order, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Genesis 2 is a focusing down particularly on the, the sixth day of creation and particularly in regard to the details in regard to man and woman, setting the scene for Genesis 3, the fall of man. So it's very simple when you look at it all. But do you realise 
what this means is Genesis is the foundation for marriage. The Genesis history is the foundation for marriage. You get rid of the Genesis history, then what is marriage? You do what William Lane Craig has done, then what is marriage? Who, who determines what marriage is? That's mytho-history, therefore I can interpret it any way I want, and I can make it two men or two women. The meaning is two. It doesn't mean anything else. That, that's what they do. That's the sort of thing they do in the church. By the way, not just marriage. Ultimately, every single biblical doctrine of theology, directly or indirectly, is founded in Genesis 1 to 11. If what I'm saying is right... And, and, and much of the church has given up Genesis 1 to 11. Even many conservative pastors haven't taught Genesis 1 to 11. If what I'm saying is right, then when you don't have that foundation, you don't have the foundation for any doctrine, ultimately. See, think about it. Why is there death and suffering in the world? Genesis 1 to 11. Why did Jesus die on a cross? Genesis 1 to 11. Why is Jesus called the last Adam? Genesis 1 to 11. Why do we need a new heavens and new earth? Genesis 1 to 11. Why we wear clothes, actually? Genesis 1 to 11. Why do we have a seven-day week? Genesis 1 to 11. Why does man have dominion? Genesis 1 to 11. Why do we have to work? Genesis 1 to 11. Why is marriage a man and a woman? Genesis 1 to 11. Do you think Genesis 1 to 11 is important? It's a foundational history for everything, but much of the church has given it up. And when you have raised up generations in the church and say, you can start outside the scripture with man's views of millions of years and everything else and, and take it here and reinterpret this, why shouldn't they do the same with marriage, which is what has happened? How do you deal with abortion? By the way, what's the answer? You start with Genesis 1 to 11. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. So God made man in his own image. How do you create the animals? Let the earth bring forth the living creatures according to their kind. And God brought the creatures to Adam to name. Um, and we know that uh, he created uh, man in a different way to the way he created the animals. He said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and every creeping thing. We could talk a lot about that, but if you want to have a, a view of environmentalism and so on, you've got to start from God's word, and man was given dominion over the creation, not the other way around, as many of our politicians have today. They have the creation having dominion over man. That's a, that's a whole other issue. But, you know, the Bible makes it very clear that man is made differently to the animals. Now, think about this for a moment. I know when I was a teacher, I was told to teach the six kingdoms of life. And two of those kingdoms were the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom. But you know, I've been thinking about this as a science teacher. And you know what I, I, I've been thinking about? Wait a minute. What is the world doing today? It's trying to indoctrinate kids. It's trying to tell them that man is just an animal. That man is no different from the animals. Wait a minute. Then from a biblical worldview perspective, shouldn't we separate man out into a separate kingdom? made in the image of God, only humans are in that kingdom, wouldn't that really help our, our kids and others start to understand we're different to the animals? I mean, I've heard people uh, who, who are pushing abortion say, get rid of spare cats, get rid of spare kids. What's the difference? We're all just animals. You know, across the river from the Creation Museum is the Cincinnati Zoo, and if you go and visit the ape exhibit, they tell you you're visiting your family. They do. All in the family. And they have a quote by uh, Jane Goodall, who studied a lot on apes. And this is the quote. We are not, after all, the only beings with personalities, rational thought and emotions. There is no sharp line dividing us from the chimps and the other apes. I mean, just look around the room, you see that. <laughs> we humans are part of and not separate from the animal kingdom. You see what the world is pushing? We're just an animal. We're all just animals. And notice it says there's no sharp line dividing us from the chimps and other apes. I don't know, every zoo I've gone to has a really sharp line uh, making that division. <laughs> I wonder why. So why not a separate kingdom for man? See, that's what I think we should be thinking through. Is that is, what? wait a minute, we, most of us, well, we've all been impacted by the world in many ways. Probably a lot of us went to the, the world's education system how do you know that we are thinking correctly from the Bible and haven't just adopted a, a secular worldview and we don't even realize it? It's like when I say to people, name me some prehistoric animals. 
in any church when I say that. They'll yell out dinosaurs and pterodactyls and all sorts of creatures. And then I say, how can you have prehistoric anything when history began from when it was recorded, Genesis 1.1? Are we really thinking with a biblical worldview or do we have a secular worldview and we sort of try to Christianize it a bit? See, we need to make sure we have a truly biblical worldview starting from God's word. The reason most people don't have that in our churches is because the churches gave up the foundation for that worldview and the Bible is looked on more as a, a book of spiritual things and moral things and, and, and so on, a book of morality or whatever, and they think all these other issues are over here. They don't get it that the Bible is the foundation for our whole worldview. Now, again, using the study of science, and this is where apologetics comes in as part of this, we know that uh, in sexual reproduction we get one set of genes, our DNA, uh, from the male and then one set from the female. And this is part of the animation of our fearfully and wonderfully made exhibit at the Creation Museum. And then you have fertilisation. And you know at fertilisation, here's the interesting thing, you now have a unique combination of information different to any other human being on earth or who's ever existed. And as that cell then develops into our body and builds our body, no new information is ever added, which means you are 100% you, human, made in the image of God right from fertilization. And you know, God's word attests to this. Because if what I'm saying is true, by the way, abortion right from fertilization is killing a human being made in the image of God. Right. Think how God's word talks about it. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. Even before your body was built, your unformed substance, you, personality, right from fertilization. Now, what does the world say? Well, my body, my rights. Isn't that what you hear all the time? In fact, Kamala Harris not that long ago tweeted this. The rights of women to make decisions about their own bodies is not negotiable. The right of women to make decisions about their own bodies is their decision. It is their body. Apparently that applies to abortion, but not anything else. Some of you may understand that, <laughs> if you think of certain mandates. So anyway, let's go on here. My body, my rights. Wait a minute. How could a fertilized egg be a woman's body if it's a male? Because where'd the Y chromosome come from? Right? And not only that, you realize a fertilized egg is looked on by the woman's body as foreign tissue because it's not the woman's tissue to reject. That's why if you have a kidney transplant, you have to take anti-rejection drugs because your body recognises the foreign tissue. And we need to understand that God built an anti-rejection mechanism into the uterus so that it wouldn't be rejected. It's incredible design. Wow. Have we taught generations to start from Genesis 1 to 11? You know, um, I was talking on this at the Creation Museum once and a young lady came out. I'd say she was in her late teens. She had tears in her eyes and she looked at me and she said, I've been to church all my life and nobody taught me what it meant about being made in God's image and what that means and separate to the animals. Nobody taught me that about DNA and the unique combination of information. And she said, what if someone like me has had an abortion? And that's when I said, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, promises to remove our sins as far as the east is from the west and to remember our sins no more. And she looked at me with a big, big smile on her face and said, thank you. It's like a release to her. And off she went. And you know, at the Creation Museum and the Fearfully and Wonderfully Made exhibit, we teach the biblical worldview to understand this issue correctly. And then we also uh, help them understand forgiveness and also God's word in regard to these issues. Let's deal with another one here real quickly. Uh, death, suffering and disease. That's a big issue. How can there be a loving God with all the death and disease in the world? Well, to understand this, we first of all need to start from where? Je do you get the feeling Genesis 1 to 11 is important? Where do we have the origin of death? Well, you know, the seven seas when you walk through them, and I'm only on the second one. We've got a long way to go tonight. Uh, corruption. Second sea is corruption. See, God created everything very good. Adam, if you 
disobey, you will surely die. The Bible makes it clear death is the consequence of sin, a judgment because of sin. What happened when Adam sinned? The Bible says God made for Adam and Eve garments of skins and clothed them. The, you know, something happened when Adam sinned. They were suddenly ashamed of their body. They didn't n- understand their nakedness before then, but it, it, it did something to them. But the clothing they made, that, that's not good enough. God made clothing for them, garments of skin and clothing. By the way, that's the origin of clothing. Why do humans wear clothes? The animals at our zoo don't wear clothes. I notice you're all wearing clothes. Here. That's good tonight. That's because you're humans, right? See, think about that. I asked Bill Nye that when I was taking him through the, through the Ark Encounter. We get to a particular point and said, why are you wearing clothes, Bill? He looked at me and uh, he said, well, there are some places in the world where it's hot where they take them off. I said, it's hot today out there. Are you going to take them off? I mean, he was sort of shocked. But I used it, I used it to present the gospel to him. Because, see, at the Creation Museum, as you walk through, you get to the sacrifice scene. The first blood sacrifice is a covering for their sin. A picture of what was to come in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God clothed Adam and Eve. We know we need to be clothed in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is pointing to the one who would be the ultimate sacrifice. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Because death is a consequence of life, there has to be the giving of life to pay the penalty for sin. Think about Leviticus. The blood was poured out as an offering to the Lord because blood represents life. There has to be the giving of life, the shedding of blood. But the Bible tells us the blood of bulls and goats can't take away our sins because we're not connected to the animals. We're separate. We're made in the image of God. Uh, And so we're different to the animals. And as you start to think it through, You realise a man brought sin and death into the world, so a man would need to pay the penalty for sin and death. We're all descendants of Adam, so one of us has to pay the penalty for sin and death, but we can't, we're all sinners. So God had a plan from eternity to step into history to be the perfect man, the God-man, to die on a cross to pay the penalty for our sin, be raised from the dead, conquers death, and offers that free gift of salvation. Wow. How can you understand the gospel if you don't understand Genesis? I can't believe the number of pastors I've heard tell people, look, if people bring up questions about evolution and so on and all the sort of thing, don't worry about it. Just tell them about Jesus. Don't worry about Genesis. Don't bring Genesis up. How do you tell someone about Jesus if, if, you, if you don't uh, believe and start with Genesis? I mean, Jesus died on the cross for you. Die? Why did he die? Well, he died because, um, well, death was a penalty for sin. Where'd that come from? Well, don't worry about that. Just believe it. I mean, you think about how, how can you explain the gospel without Genesis 1 to 11? And then what about if you believe in millions of years like William Lane Craig and the majority of our Christian leaders, sadly, uh, in our Western world? In fact, all around the world, I would say. You know, if you believe in millions of years, as I said, millions of years came out of atheism. And if you look in the fossil record that supposedly was laid down millions of years before man, there's lots of evidence of animals eating each other, bones in their stomachs. Wait a minute, originally the Bible says that God gave Adam and Eve fruit to eat and he said the animals ate plants. So originally all animals and man were vegetarian. It wasn't until after the flood that God said to humans, just as I gave you the plants, green plants, and that's actually reiterating the fact that you were vegetarian originally, now I give you everything, now I give you all things. That's the reason you can eat a hot dog, because it is everything, right? (laughs) Do you realize the origin of a hot dog is in Genesis 1 to 11? Do Do you realize that? See, it's true. If you believe in millions of years, you know what else is in the fossil record? Evidence of diseases. There's lots of diseases in the bones, a lot of documentation on this. Tumors and arthritis and abscesses and cancer. Wait a minute. If you have these diseases in the bones of these creatures in the fossil record millions of years before man, after God created man, he said everything he made was very good, then God's calling cancer very good, all those diseases very good? That doesn't fit with the nature of God and who he is. These two things can't be true at the same time, which means those layers couldn't have been laid down over millions of years. They couldn't have been laid down over millions of years They had to be laid down after sin. How do you understand fossils? You start with Genesis 1 to 11. If there really was a global flood, right, that third sea, 
What would you expect to find? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. What do you find? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. You know, I've had, I've had atheists say to me, I don't see any evidence for a flood. I mean, yeah, you have billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth, but there was no flood because they've already been indoctrinated to believe they were laid down over millions of years. Now, tomorrow night, I'm going to deal with this issue, races and racism. And we're going to start with Genesis 1 to 11, right? And as we do that, that's the fourth C, and I'm not going to do that tonight. And so if we're all descendants of Adam and Eve, that means there's only one race. Right there, we're starting to realize, wait a minute, from a biblical worldview perspective, we as Christians shouldn't be talking about the races. There's only one biological race. And then when we understand it correctly, when Noah and his family came off the ark, and what does Genesis 9 say? The sons of Noah went forth from the ark, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and they gave rise to the people of the whole earth. So they went through an event called the Tower of Babel. God gives different languages. You move away from each other, and depending on which combinations of genes survive in a particular group, you get your different people groups, but not races. And we start to understand what has gone on. We'll talk about skin colour tomorrow night and all sorts of interesting issues. Did you know that there are no black people and there are no white people? Did you know that we're all the same skin colour, just different shades? And when we start dividing black and white, and there's a black man, there's a white man. See, I'm not a white person, right? We're all actually brown. It depends upon how much or how little of the brown that we have. I'll explain all that tomorrow night. Can you imagine if we raised up generations to have the right foundation from God's word beginning in Genesis 1 to 11? We would pray that those that have been raised up that way, equipped with answers to know how to defend the Christian faith, we pray they would survive the moral tornado of today. But if you haven't been taught that way, that's why we're losing so many in our younger generations. And so to sum it all up, two castle diagrams, I've used these going back to actually uh, the 70s. Uh, because these, this is really the battle. See, the battle has never changed. This is, these are the same basic diagrams I've used uh, ever since I've been in this ministry for over 40 years. A battle between two foundations. Man's word, God's word. Man's word, sand. A worldview, secular humanism, moral relativism. God's word, uh, and God's word begins with Genesis 1 to 11, and then Christian worldview and the doctrines of Christianity, Christian morality. The devil knows if you wanted to destroy this castle, how do you do it? Well, what, what's the attack? The attack is on the word of God. And in this day and age, the attack has particularly been focused on Genesis 1 to 11, the Genesis 3 attack of our time, and much of the church has succumbed to that same attack. And then they look up here and say, how do we deal with all these problems? But they're not. They're symptoms of the one problem down here. And so what our ministry is all about, and the literature we have, the books, the attractions, and so on, is to help raise up generations with the right foundation, beginning with Genesis 1 to 11, to have the right worldview, uh, to know what they believe and why, equipped with answers to be able to defend the Christian faith and deal foundationally with the problem over here, only then can we deal with these issues up here. That's what this ministry is all about. And the, and the last thing, which I won't go into now in detail, because it's in the book, is if you start to understand this now, the foundations, the worldview, and then the outworking of that worldview, um, and, and we start to realise the real battle's down here. So when you're arguing with someone in regard to Christian things, you need to be focused on the fact that I've got to get the battle down to the foundation, right? So, give you an example. I had a guy come up to me at a conference and he said, I'm gay, I believe in gay marriage. What do you say about that? And I said, can I tell you what I believe? Because I start from the Bible. He says, I don't believe the Bible. Don't give me that Bible stuff. And so my answer to him was, what? Because a lot of Christians I have found... They got this idea, if someone says they don't believe the Bible, oh, yeah, I, we don't start with the Bible then. We've got to have this evidence out here. But see, if you give up your foundation of God's word, you've lost the battle. Because you've let them have their foundation of man's word. And so even if it's someone who claims they're a Christian, 
we obviously have a difference in our foundation in regard to what we believe about that foundation. So the battle is still down here. And then I said to that person, you don't believe the Bible? Well, guess what? I do. <laughs> What's your problem with that? I, and, and then I bait them. What I mean by that is this. I know, I know what they've been taught in school and through the media and, and so on. What, do you believe in evolution or something? Do you think the Bible, do you think science has disproved the Bible? What do you believe? I mean, what, 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 what's some of your reasons for not believing in the Bible? What do you believe about where you came from or who you are? Who determines right and wrong? Who, you know, be, because that, they'll even use words like good and bad. How can you word, use words like good and bad? Who decides what's good? Who decides what's bad? You know, you, you deal with all those issues because if you don't get the battle down here, you're never going to get anywhere up here. And that's the bottom line. You know the same is true when talking about um, evidence in regard to geology and biology? Don't get me wrong. We use evidences and so on, and we talk about you know, assumptions and radiometric dating and fossils and all the rest of it. But don't get the idea that evidence does the convincing because all evidence is interpreted based upon your worldview. So you can give an interpretation of that evidence, but they've got a different worldview. They don't see it the way you do. Now, it can cause them to think that's true, but then you've got to make sure that you get them down to the right foundation. And that's a, that's a whole other issue, a whole other talk uh, that we can deal with. And so very quickly, uh, the book Divided Nation does what I did tonight, but it's got more in it than that. It's got all the illustrations in there and a link where you can go and download these illustrations free of charge. That's um, in, in the beginning introduction. I uh, encourage you to use our AnswersInGenesis.org website. And there's thousands of articles there. Creation to Babel. Uh, I just came out with this recently. Actually, we just got it back into print, just in time for us to, to bring some here, uh, because the first printing just sold out uh, very quickly before Christmas. This is a really different commentary. It's a commentary on Genesis 1 to 11. Everything I've ever been asked about Genesis, I deal with in there. Someone asked me about the Nephilim this morning. I deal with that in there. Uh, and. But I deal with it all, but it's done in a, in a very readable way for the whole family, and yet I do deal with all these hard issues and the meaning of the word day, but it's done in, in a way that's readable. You know, a lot of commentaries you use, you spend a whole week on one page trying to figure out what they're saying. Uh, you know what I mean, don't you? And all the meanings of words. I'm not saying there's something, anything wrong with that, not at all, but this is a very different commentary. And it's verse by verse through Genesis 1 to 11. And so deals with all these, these issues. Uh, Divided Nation I, I talked about. Will They Stand? That's another new book I came up with recently. It's, it's on the family. And it's really a lot, a lot of my own testimony about how parents, our parents raised us up foundationally and with apologetics. And then um, talk about uh, what, what does God say in regard to how to train children? You know, uh, where to be salt, but you've got to have salt in you and the salt's not to be contaminated. What is... God's word say about how to raise children and then what does God's word say the role of men and women because today most men don't carry on their God given God commanded responsibility to be the spiritual head of their house and so uh, that uh, book has has a lot of that's a lot of people have, have said who've read it said it's the most powerful book that I've written there's a chapter on my wife Mally as well and our daughter Renee who started our Christian school 12 stones Christian Academy who's looking for some teachers for next year because the school is growing in fact, teachers in, in basically all grades. And um, so um, keep that in mind if you're a teacher or want to be a teacher, we're going to be a teacher. Uh, so she's written a whole chapter there on biblical worldview because it's a unique Christian school with a true biblical worldview. Gospel Reset I did this morning, how to evangelize a culture that has changed foundation, a culture today like the Greeks, not like the Jews, and understanding that difference. My book, The Lie... Um, that really deals with, uh, and, and that was the first book I wrote, but I've uh, updated over the years, of course. But all of our doctrines are founded in Genesis. Stop compromising Genesis. And then we just produced a book on the gender and marriage war. A lot of our speakers together um, put in there everything we could think of in regard to that issue to help you be equipped. One Race, One Blood, I'm dealing on that, uh, with that tomorrow night. And then Glasshouse, all the classic arguments for evolution, uh, refuted. My son-in-law and I put that together. I'd like to see every high school student have one of those. These are the biggest selling creation apologetics books in the world. They have 160 of the Genesis 3 attack questions of our age answered in detail. I'd love to see every church go through them as a study. 
every one of us. If you've got those answers, you, you'll be incredibly equipped. And then we have books that have the quick answers to social issues and tough questions. And so uh, we brought along those core resources for you, and uh, there's uh, core resources out there for kids as well uh, that you'll see. And we have a You Choose program. You can put together different combinations of books at discounted prices, and you'll see uh, those signs out there. We also have uh, a VBS program. The one for this year is on the sanctity of life. We're in the top three VBS programs sold in the world, and I believe this, our VBS is the most powerful because it deals with apologetics, biblical authority. We have science experiments. It's evangelistic uh, and so on. And then I want to mention our Answers Bible Curriculum, four-year Sunday school curriculum that is apologetics, biblical authority, chronological, teaches Christian worldview. There is no other program like it in the world. 10,000 churches are using it. Churches tell us it revolutionizes their churches. And we have all the digital helps in the world, and we have uh, a homeschool version as well that we're now releasing. Uh, so I encourage you to have a look at all that. Um, if you're interested, too, you can find out about our Answers magazine, award-winning magazine. It has a kids' magazine, a family magazine, a digital magazine. And uh, if you subscribe out there, we'll uh, give you a free DVD for each year to subscribe. And the one last thing I want to mention is our streaming service, Answers.tv. We have our own streaming service. We have 5,000 videos on there right now. We have videos in Spanish, in Arabic as well. And we have creationist nature programs, uh, programs for kids, science experiments, animal encounters, Bible lessons for kids, animated books. Uh, we have uh, all the uh, lectures, conferences, and so on. Nothing else like it. And don't forget, we're hiring. <laughs> all right, with that, I'll... Uh, Hand over to Dr. Anderson uh, to close.